The reality is, for about 20 years, uh, we've had compounding problems. They get a little bit bigger every year. And we have, if you'll pardon my saying so, for a couple of decades, kicked the can down the road and hoped things would get better. And I want to let you know uh, that it is my intention to no longer kick the can down the road. But but to fix it, and to fix it in a big way, in a big way that's going to require your help. And I'm going to tell you about that on Sunday, September the 8th. I want to ask you to prepare for Sunday, September the 8th in two ways. First, um, I want you to watch the sermon that I preached last May. called First Baptist Church in the Valley of Dry Bones. I preached it on Ezekiel 36. You can find it on our website, or if you go to Google and you just type in First Baptist Church in the Valley of Dry Bones, it'll show up. Sometime between now and the next three weeks, I want you to watch that sermon. Uh, My diagnosis of the problem is not going to be significantly different than what I shared with you over a year ago. And then the second thing I want you to do is I want you to pray. Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to 14, and I want to look at it together with you this morning. And this is what God says. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this is a text of Scripture that reveals your rich power 
in the midst of weakness and death and decay. In a hopeless situation, Father, this is a text from your prophet that reminds us that there is always hope in God. There is always hope and never room for despair when the God of heaven and earth unleashes his power. And so, Father, I pray that you would reveal your power in this place this morning. As your people in a city that belongs to you, gathers from all over that city, I'm praying that your powerful spirit that brought life to dead bones would give life to the preaching of the word and would revive this church. Father, we ask you to do what only you could do. And we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a text that is familiar to so many of you. It's a text that you probably didn't even need to hear read aloud, so many of you, because you've heard it so many times before. It is a text that has uh, lasting value in our memories. One of the reasons that preachers tell stories and give illustrations is because they want to take an old text that might threaten to seem irrelevant and they want to show that it is relevant. They want to show that the story has life. They want to show that the words have vitality. This is a text in scripture that there's no illustration that I could give that would add anything to it. It's already good enough. It's already interesting enough. It's a story about dry, white, bleached bones that spring up and get covered with flesh and covered with skin and then get restored to life. That's the most interesting thing I've ever heard. I, I don't have a story that I can tell you that'll, that'll be more interesting than that. The reason we remember this story, the reason we remember this account is because it's the nature of the story to just lodge in our brain. And that's the point. So this morning, I want to take a very familiar passage and give it a fresh look today. Help us to see how a text like this from about 2,500 years ago has everything to do with the situation we face in 2018 in Jacksonville, Florida at the First Baptist Church. In order to figure out what the text means for us today, you have to know what it meant back then. And so I want us to see the context of this text, which is the prophet Ezekiel in the land of Babylon. The Israelites had been carried out of Israel into their Babylonian captivity. And God appears to the prophet Ezekiel. He appears and the text tells us that he picks him up and he places him in a valley. And he sees these dry bones. These dry bones that Ezekiel sees are a visual parable. You know what a parable is. It's a story that is told to give relevance and authenticity and meaning to a kingdom situation. Ezekiel's vision in the valley of dry bones is a parable. And it's a visual parable. It's a parable you can see. You can behold these bones. You can behold the valley. It's a parable about a devastating situation. Chapter 37, verse 11 says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We're completely cut off. God says, Ezekiel, when I take you over these dry bones, when I take you back and forth and let you have a good look, let me tell you what you're seeing. You're seeing my people Israel cast out of my land into a place of foreign captivity. 
And the picture that God can think of to illustrate that is a, is a valley of dry bones. Very many dry bones. Very dry, dry bones. You want to know how bad it is for my people to be out of their land? You think of a valley full of dead bodies. You think of a valley full of decomposed dead bodies. And all there is is bones as dry as the sand. That's how bad it is to be apart from the blessing of God. Verse 2 says, He caused me to pass among them round and about, and behold, they were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. Israel had sinned against God. They had fallen short of what God had called them to do, and now they'd been cast out of the land, and they were in a hopeless situation. We're completely cut off. They said, it's all over. And they had biblical reason to think that. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15, the Bible says, It shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. In verses 32 to 33, it says, Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people while your eyes look on and yearn for them continually, but there will be nothing you can do. A people whom you do not know shall eat up the produce of your ground and all your labors, and you will never be anything but oppressed and crushed continually. Verse 36 says, The Lord will bring you and your king whom you, whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. The Israelites had sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned, and now Deuteronomy 28 had happened, and they knew the eggs had been scrambled. They knew it was all over. They knew they'd been cut off, and they were without hope. And as God shows Ezekiel the hopeless situation of a pile of dry bones, he asks a strange and a tricky question. Verse 3, he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now, on the face of it, that's not a tricky question at all. Well, God, uh, it's a pile of dry bones. So no, they can't live. On the face of it, it's a really easy question. Can dry bones live? No. Can a pile of dry bones live? No. Can a pile of dry bones that are very dry live? No. Of course not. What makes it tricky? Well, what makes it tricky is that Ezekiel knows more about God than what his eyes are beholding in that valley. Ezekiel knows about the power of God. Ezekiel hadn't just read Deuteronomy 28, he'd read Deuteronomy 32. And in Deuteronomy 32, verse 39, he says, God does, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, it is I who heal. God puts to death, but God brings to life. Ezekiel likely heard the preaching of the prophet Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, the prophet Jeremiah says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. So Ezekiel sees a valley of dry bones. But he also sees a God who made the heavens and the earth, and he agrees that there's nothing too difficult for you. And so a simple question becomes tricky when you add in the power of God. Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel sees the desperate situation, but he also sees hope and the power of God. And he says one of the most remarkable and humble things he could have said. Lord God, you know. You know. It's a response that looks seriously at a serious situation. 
and is yet full of hope in the power of God. The power of God brings hope out of hardship. It brings life out of death and joy out of despair. Can these bones live, son of man? Oh, Lord God, you know. And he doesn't make him wait even till the next verse before he starts answering. He said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. Ezekiel's trust and the power of God pays off immediately. And the good work begins. We continue to read that the decomposition process is reversed for the bones. The bones come together. Sinews strap around them. Flesh covers them over and skin covers that and then breath enters into that. It's the exact opposite of how you die and decompose and God reverses it immediately after hearing this expression of hope and confidence from his prophet. This vision has a very specific historical context. But it's also a vision that gives encouragement about restoration from any dark valley. Because if God can reconnect a pile of bones... If God can breathe life into a corpse, if God can restore his wayward people from a foreign land, then God can do anything. It's a text that teaches us about the power of God bringing hope out of hardship. That is Ezekiel in Babylon. And now I want to talk about First Baptist Church in 2018. We are not in Ezekiel's valley of dry bones, but we are in our own valley of dry bones. We are going through our own set of trials, and I want to talk to you about that. I'm not excited about talking to you about that. Uh, I'm, my enthusiasm about it probably rivals Ezekiel's about looking at a pile of dead bodies. But as we move forward together, there's no way for me to stand here and fail to look you in the eye and tell you the truth about where we are. So I'm not going to do that. I count a number of challenges we face in our church right now in 2018. One challenge is we are still in the throes of a pastoral transition. One of the most painful things you can go through in your life is change. Nobody likes change. Change is painful and hard and tiring. And we just have to admit that some of the bones we're looking at today are the bones of change. It's just a reality. Here's some other bones that we're facing. Some other challenges we face. First Baptist Church is 182 years old, and as we sit here together in 2018, I guess there's probably never been a time in the history of our church when the message we believe was more unfamiliar to the city in which we live. We believe that God made people to live and function according to a certain set of rules that he gives us in the Bible. We believe we have fallen short of those rules and done what the Bible calls sin. We believe that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life and die on a cross and rise from the grave and ascend to heaven where he sits on a throne right now. And that everybody must repent of their sins and turn to him in order to have life. We believe you don't get to live life your own way. We believe that you don't just get a pass when you sin, but that sin costs God dearly in the life of his son. Saying that message in 2018 in Jacksonville, Florida is harder than it's ever been. 
because we've watched a culture shift really over the last 10 to 15 years. If you had told Homer Lindsay Jr. what would be going on in 2015 and 16 and 17 in the city of Jacksonville, I don't think he could have possibly believed you. I don't think he could have understood. We've experienced such a rapid shift in our culture. Here's another pile of bones. We're a church in decline. We've been a church in decline for 20 years. I want you to think about two decades, the decade between 1997 and the decade uh, the decade between 97 and 07, and the decade between 07 and 17. The decade that began with 1997 and went to 2007 was a period of modest decline. It was the first real decline our church had experienced in about three decades, maybe four. Been rapid growth, rapid expansion of the gospel in this church And by 1997, you start to see a decline, and then there's a period of modest decline until 07. The decade between 2007 and 2017 was a period of rapid decline. Uh, It was the most significant decline we've ever experienced in the history of the First Baptist Church. If we could take a picture of the people who were sitting here in 2007 and then compare it to a picture we would take of the people sitting here in 2017, you'd see that half of the people left. Sunday school is even worse than that. Sunday school is important because Sunday school is where relationships happen, it's where discipleship happens, and it's a representation of the most faithful folks in our church. We had more people in Sunday school in 1969 than we have in 2018. We have witnessed literally the erasing of decades of gospel expansion. Now, I don't want to lead you astray. Numbers aren't everything. Far from it. There is more to a great and a healthy church than numbers. Um, Regardless of what the history of decline here is, and regardless of what the situation is with attendance, uh, there's no place else I'd rather be. You, You have become our family over the last two and a half years, and I wanna be here no matter what. And that's because this is a wonderful church. But, Numbers are a stubborn reality with very, very practical consequences. You you can't keep declining. You can't keep losing people. If we don't arrest and reverse the pattern of decline we are on right now, we will have an attendance of zero in 10 to 12 years. That's how rapid the departures are. The decline has been so significant that over the last several years, for the first time since 1943, First Baptist Church couldn't pay all of its bills and we had to go into debt. First time since debt free in 43. That's a pile of bones. You can't live that way. You got to change it. And this morning, we need to confront the question as a church that God posed to Ezekiel so many thousands of years ago. Can these bones live? Will the decline stop? 
Will gospel witness and faithfulness and expansion continue? And we won't be far off if our answer is something like Ezekiel's. Lord God, you know. But when we say, oh, Lord God, you know, we've got to remember that we say, oh, Lord God, you know, with hearts full of hope. Because Ezekiel's vision is an eternal testament that you can never write off a people whose hope is in the God who restores life to dry bones. And so for the rest of our time together this morning, I want to talk about the restoration of our dry bones. I want to talk about what it would look like and what lessons we can learn from the restoration of dry bones in the 500s BC with the Babylonian captivity. What can we learn about that restoration and apply to ours? We are not in Ezekiel's Valley. We're not the Israelites in captivity, but there's lessons we can learn from Ezekiel's vision. And I want to give you five lessons that we've got to learn right now, this morning, as we commit ourselves to moving forward together. Here's the first one. Restoration is not required. It's very important for me to tell you the truth. It's very important for me to tell you the truth about where we are as a church, and it's very important for me to tell you the truth about what the Bible says. And the Bible here does not guarantee restoration. There's no presumption in Ezekiel's answer. Son of man, can these bones live? Oh, Lord God, you know. Not a whiff of presumption. Ezekiel knows what God could do. He doesn't presume to say what God would do, and he certainly doesn't undertake the task of telling God what he must do. God doesn't need First Baptist Church in Jacksonville. God does not need First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, any more than he needs a pile of bones in Babylon. Christ's church will thrive with or without us. And we need to just let that sink in for a few minutes and ask ourselves how we feel about that. I'll say some more about it in a minute. Here's a second. Restoration requires the power of God. If restoration is to happen, it requires the power of God. Ezekiel 37, 12 to 14 says, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. And then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. When you are facing a challenging task, you need God's power. When we confront our dry bones in 2018, just like Ezekiel confronted his dry bones in his day, we need God's power. Several years ago, we were um, with my in-laws on a vacation, and uh, we, had, uh, uh, we were at this place that had a really nice pool complex, and we were going to go out in the pool that afternoon, but it was a big thunderstorm. We couldn't go outside. So we were in the hotel room reading the Bible, and uh, back then, uh, my kid's favorite story was uh, Jesus uh, calming the storm. So we were reading about Jesus calming the storm. And uh, I said, I wonder what kind of power it took for Jesus to say, peace be still, and the storm stopped. 
and I asked the kids, I said, I wonder if we could come up with that kind of power. I wonder if we could scream loud enough at the storm and get it to stop. And so we decided to go out and try. <laughs> so we opened up the screen door and walked out onto the balcony. And on three, we counted backwards. We said, we're going to scream at the top of our lungs. Three, two, one. Peace be still! And do you know what happened? <laughs> Nothing happened. All right? <laughs> Nothing happened because <laughs> we're not Jesus Christ. See? And you can put four people together and scream at the top of your lungs and nothing's going to happen because there's some things that just require the power of God. What a fool Ezekiel would have looked like. wonder if he was afraid he was going to be made to look a fool. I, I prophesied as I was commanded. Dry bones come to life. There's no voice of a prophet. There's no conjuring of emotion that can bring those bones back together. It takes the power of God. We need the power of God at First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. If the hand of God will not rouse us from our slumber, then we will never awaken. But when God lifts up his hand, dead bones come back together, and restoration happens. Restoration requires the power of God. If it's going to happen, God has to show up. Third thing, restoration is focused on knowing the Lord is God. The focus of restoration is on exalting the Lord as God. Verse 6 says, I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive and you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 13 says, then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves. What's the point of restoration. What's the point of getting your life back? Hey, look, my body works. It's great. It's great to be back alive again. It's great to be back out of captivity and back at the old homestead and go do the stuff we always used to do down by the Dead Sea and over up at the Sea of Galilee. It's great. The point of restoration is not you. And it wasn't the Israelites. The point of restoration is that the Israelites would know that someone is God and it's not them, it's the Lord. If First Baptist Church is going to be restored, it can't be about First Baptist Church. It can't be about being the big place in town. It can't even be about our wonderful memories of the wonderful things that happened here, although they are wonderful. This has to be about Jesus Christ. We have to agree together that our memories of what happened in the past just aren't a replacement for the exciting things that God wants to do in the future. We have to be committed to telling a city about Jesus Christ. We're here and always have been. To tell the city of Jacksonville about Jesus. And if we have any other agenda, if that great task remains unfinished, then we deserve to die if we don't care about it. And 10 years would be too long to wait for it to happen. No reason for us to be doing anything except being sure that Jacksonville knows Jesus Christ is the Lord. That's got to be the focus of our restoration. Fourth thing. Restoration doesn't require people. It requires the power of God. That's what we talked about. Restoration does not require people, but God uses people. 
and restoring things. Isn't that wonderful? Chapter 37, verse 7. I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. God didn't need Ezekiel, you see. God could have brought the bones together. He could have strapped the flesh and the sinews and the skin on. He could have injected the breath without a prophet. He did not need Ezekiel. But he used Ezekiel. Isn't that the most wonderful thing? God doesn't need you in this city. He doesn't need me in this city. He doesn't need us in this church, but he wants to use us. He wants to include us in what he is doing. What I said earlier is true. God can save Jacksonville without First Baptist. He can save Jacksonville without you. But is that what you want? Is that what you want? It's not what I want. God has given us an unfinished task. He's given us a word, a savior to preach to this city. And our heart's cry has to be, God save Jacksonville, but don't do it without me. God restore this church, but don't do it without me. You could do it without me. Please God, don't do it without me. Don't let me burn up my life on ski trips and vacations, and stockpiling the 401k. Help me to hand it all in for Jesus so that Jacksonville would know who he is. God doesn't need us, but he uses us. It's the whole reason we're here, is to let this city know. And the last thing, the fifth thing, restoration is something God loves. Restoration is something God loves. Restoration is not required. He doesn't have to do it. You get cocky if you don't get the first point. Well, God just has to use me. He has to restore the things I like. He has to do what I want him to do. You can't get cocky. Restoration is not required. But there's a lot of hope in knowing that restoration is something God loves. Verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life. Why'd God do that? Why not just let the dry bones lay there? Why not just let the people rot in captivity? Would have been fine. That was the rules. Set the rules, broke the rules. It's on you now. Why not? Because God loves restoration. God, I take it, would rather restore dead bones than raise up a whole new fresh life. By the way, that's what he did with you. Why didn't God just strike you dead the first time you ever sinned in your life? It's the same reason he sent Jesus Christ to live and to die and to rise for you because God loves to take what's broken and dead and destroyed and restore it to life. God gets more glory for himself when dead bones walk around than if something new happened. God loves restoration. And you know what? God doesn't love Restoration only in general. He loves restoration at the First Baptist Church. God has loved to restore our church at times in the past. May 3rd, 1901. The great fire of Jacksonville destroyed 146 city blocks of this city. Included in those blocks were the blocks that had the property of the First Baptist Church on them. Church property wiped out. A pile of ash left in its place. But the church membership and the church leadership got to work. 
And by February 14th, 1904, they had dedicated a new building. They went out into the streets of this city and they preached the gospel to peoples whose lives had been burned to ashes by the fire. And shortly after they got into their new building, they baptized the first person, J.W. Gooding, who'd come to faith and began walking with the Lord at this church. And from 1904 to 1923, the First Baptist Church engaged in the evangelization of this city and in a massive church planting operation that planted 14 churches in less than 20 years. There are people at church right now across this city at churches that don't bear the name First Baptist Church because First Baptist members worked hard to spread the gospel to this city and plant new and vibrant churches. In 1940, the church was broke. A lot had changed from 1923 to 1940. In those few years, the church had lost all its property, not to fire this time, but to foreclosure. They had the largest debt in the Southern Baptist Convention. But the leadership and the membership came together and they spread the gospel to the city again. They undertook a massive evangelism campaign. And the results were so astounding that they called it a miracle. They called it the miracle of downtown Jacksonville. Between 1975 and 1985, over 11,000 people were baptized upon their profession of faith in Jesus Christ. We celebrate great awakenings in this country that didn't see as many people saved. The point of that is not just that God loves restoration and not just that God has had his hand on the First Baptist Church and loves to restore us in times of trial. The other point of that is that when First Baptist Church is on the ropes, we go back to Jesus Christ. We remember afresh who he is and what he's done, and we go to our city, and we preach his good news to a lost and a dying city. For 182 years, the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida, has been in this city preaching Christ, telling lost people about Jesus, building saved people up into Jesus. And I'm just telling you the reason we're still here through fire and foreclosure and debt and all the rest The reason we're still here is because Jacksonville still needs to know who Jesus is. The Savior of Jacksonville is the same person today as it was in the 1830s. And his name is Jesus Christ. We are living in a city surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people that one day will meet God, and they are not ready. They're not ready to meet him. When they die today, they will give an account that they can't answer. Because the only way to meet God, the only way to be ready for that fateful day is to know his son Jesus. Our unfinished task has to be to give everything we've got to prepare a city to meet its maker, 
to introduce the lost people of this city to the most amazing man anyone ever heard of. And once they call on the name of Jesus Christ to begin the good and the hard work of building them up into the image of Jesus Christ. What's the future look like at First Baptist Church? Well, in a weird sort of way, the future looks exactly like the past. We're going to do what the men and the women and the boys and the girls at this church have done every time we get into trouble. We're going back to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we just lost our way. We we lost our seriousness about spreading the name of Jesus to this city. I'm not saying that each of you quit sharing the gospel. I don't mean that. There's, there's hundreds of you, and we've even seen the report of people who are still talking about Jesus. But we lost our fervor to, in a comprehensive way, work this army of believers to get them out into the streets in a systematic and in a careful way that holds people accountable to point lost people to Jesus Christ, and we're going back to it. The future of the First Baptist Church is out into the streets of this city, into the neighborhoods and the coffee shops and the restaurants and the gas stations to let people know that Jesus Christ is alive, and he's alive for them. I am standing before you today in a way that is different than I had anticipated and quite frankly is quite different than I wanted. But regardless of the circumstances that brought me to this point this morning, I want you to know that of all the places in the whole world I could be, I wouldn't rather be any place but here. There is no challenge we are facing as a church that I don't want to face together with you. Over the last two and a half years, you have become our family. You have become our home. And I love you, and my family loves you. And we want to see what God is going to do in this city as we unite our hands together and move forward into the future for what God has. I am standing before you. Is nobody important? Nothing to commend me except the grace of God. And I'm saying to you that I am willing to give you everything I've got. Talked about this with the kids last night got their buy-in. Lauren and I have talked about it many times. We want to pour in and spend our life and our energy at this church with you and see what happens when Jesus saves a city. I want to ask if we could stand together towards that great task. I want to ask, as I stand before you, If you would stand before me and we could link arms and move and march into the future for what God has for this church and this city. I want to ask, I want to ask that you would stand and make a commitment today, a sacred commitment. Whether you are eight or whether you are 80 that you're handing in the rights to your life and you are going to give everything you have for a man whose name is Jesus because he gave everything for you. And you're going to pour your life into a church that still loves him and you're going to pour your life into a city that still needs him. And if you say, well, what does that mean? What does it require? I'm going to say to you, whatever it takes, 
whatever it takes, whatever you have to trade in, but that you would commit, I'm going to give my prayers, I'm going to give my time, I'm going to give my energy, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ at this church. Whatever it takes that Jacksonville would know Jesus Christ. I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Let's pray. Father, put life in our bones. Restore us. Show us Jesus Christ. Make us passionate for his name in this city. Help us to trade everything in so that Jacksonville would know Jesus and that Christians at the First Baptist Church would be built up in his glorious name. Do it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to have a time of response. Perhaps you need to respond because you want to commit yourself in a fresh, demonstrable, and in a verbal way to the work of Christ in this church and in this city. I want to invite you to come. Perhaps you've heard the gospel here this morning and you've never heard it. I want to let you know the most amazing life that was ever breathed into a dead body didn't happen in Ezekiel 37. It happened in the life of Jesus Christ as he gave up his life for you. And you came here out of curiosity or whatever today, but you want to know this Christ. You want to repent of your sins and trust in him. If that's you, I want to invite you to come. Perhaps you need to recommit your life in some way. If that's true of you, then you come as we continue in worship and response.